Hey, <laughs> there he is, Mr. Graduate. Here, you're headed to Columbus, huh? That's right. What are you doing for heaven? Well, I'll be uh, working as a finance analyst at Ameribank. That's a pretty girlfriend of yours. I haven't seen her. Are you going to be moving to Columbus, too? I'm not. I'm going to New York. New York. I'm kind of having a quarter-life crisis panic attack right now. Maybe take it easy. Yeah, I got a new hire here, Brian Jeffries. You might like it here. We're like a family. You got anything you need help with? No. Relax. George Pfeiffer. I don't do anything at this job. In a 40-hour work week, I probably work 10 hours. I know we're not as funny as your college roommates, but you're stuck with us. And knowing that I have to do this for the next four decades, and now all alone, Amanda gone? Why don't we grab a couple guys Thursday? What's a guy? Oh, I call beers guys. I'll grab a guy. I'll, I'll grab a couple guys. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen your face. <laughs> Baby, let's take a sagoon. I mean, is there any way you can re-enroll in Columbus? Brian, my spot there is long gone. Well, then I'll get a job here in New York. Can't you just accept that we had a good run? You don't like me. You don't know me. What's my path? I can't tell you your path. That's why it's your path. This sea brew is delicious. Cheers! Cheers. 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 Okay. I'm gonna go. New York's quite a trip from Ohio. This is my favorite shirt. Really? Yeah, Nordstrom Rack. Oh, the rack's kinda nice. Oh man, you probably have a sweet bachelor pad. Don't play with this. I'm generating too much tart. I'm going for icers. I love that. It's like you're a uh, business cowboy. Pew-pew. Get a Lou Dobbs in the system. I don't know if I want that in my system. A couple oh, Rex Grossman's. You guys work desk jobs, don't you? I'm gonna have to get used to this whole not being on a college campus thing. I keep having this dream. Playing baseball, right? And I'm in the batter's box. And the pitcher throws a fastball. The ball's coming in. It's right about to hit my bat. And it stops. And then the ball starts spinning round and round and round the bat. And I move my arms, jerk my shoulders forward, and I can't hit it. And I wake up. I've been having that dream since I was eight. I, I mean, look at what you've got here. Your place is a dump. Yeah, I'd like to change my flight from uh, LaGuardia to Columbus. Dude. George is an idiot. That's the universe, baby. Lock in. and I'm here with the Bozeman Film Celebration and I'm interviewing Michael Pomeroy, who is the director of The Rest of Your Life. Michael, introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, for listening. <laughs> Shout out to all the listeners out there. Um, yeah, Michael, I'm a writer, director, um, actor, producer. I did a lot of things on this movie. <laughs> yeah, um, I wrote them all down. Editor, so many things. Yeah, um, but yeah, I'm based in New York City, um, originally from Columbus, Ohio, but yeah, you know, I've spent my, my 20s in, in New York doing stand-up comedy, acting, writing, and uh, which has led me to directing films, and yeah, the rest of your life is my first feature film, um, you know, made some shorts and web series and, and all that stuff beforehand, um, but yeah, this is my first feature. We shot it in 2020 during the pandemic, um, and it came out... Uh, this fall in festivals and on, on streaming. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I can start going into all the intros and plot summaries yeah. and everything, well, but I'll, I'll let you kind of guide this. Sure. Well, you mentioned that you're from Columbus and that you currently live in New York City. So I see that there's some similarities between you and Brian. So tell me a little bit about how this movie started, how it came about. Yeah, definitely. So the the movie's definitely semi autobiographical in nature. Um, probably an emphasis on semi. Not all the things of the movie um, are quite true, but um, you know, I always kind of write from what's happened to me. I've never really uh, been one to you know create high concept worlds with anything that I'm writing and directing. Shout out mm -hmm. to anyone who's doing fantasy or action adventure type films, but I've always <laughs> kind of just written based on what's happened to me. And um, yeah, you know, when I was 22 years old, I was in my first job out of college. I worked at a consulting company. Um, so I was, you know, traveling around for work and wearing a suit and all of these things that maybe look glamorous on TV. I was just very bored. I found myself kind of in this office drone type setting where I really 
was shocked at how little I was doing in this nine to five job. I mean, I truly would spend hours doing nothing. And I was, you know, traveling alone by myself. And that's really when I started writing um, lots of scripts and screenplays and stuff. So yeah, the rest of your life, which is about this, you know, corporate drone named Brian who moves to Columbus, Ohio for his first job, uh, very much based on my own existence. Um, and you know, really, I wanted to capture that that loneliness that you know so often happens when you graduate college and you get into your you know first working experience and you know struggling to find community, especially after you know maybe being in college where you know you have your friends and everything. And the story follows Brian, you know, who's with this girl Amanda, who's been his longtime girlfriend over high school and college. She moves away to New York for medical school, a different city from from him, and you know he sort of has this existential crisis and. The circumstances of that were definitely a little bit different for me. I, I did not have a six-year relationship <laughs> at the end of college that kind of went in different ways, but, you know, was very much in one of those uh, situations after college where, you know, the girl I was seeing went to a different city and, you know, trying to manage that with long distance and phone calls and visits. And yeah. um, from talking to a lot of friends who have seen this movie, it seems like this is a kind of a common occurrence. I think if we find ourselves interested in people in college and then life happens and people move to different places. So that was kind of the genesis of the story, both just the the loneliness of, you know, working this corporate job. And then the, the girl moves away. It doesn't quite work out the way you thought right. it would. And, you know, really I had this moment when I was 22, 23 of like, what is my life? What am I doing? And this idea of working a job for 40 years, kind of this sort of American dream, if you will, that our parents' generation uh, very much subscribed to. Like, I was like, is this it? This kind of sucks, <laughs> you know? I thought it would be so much more. And um, yeah, I started writing the script in 2017, kind of about two years after sort of this existential crisis of mine. Um, and then, yeah, I didn't start shooting the film until almost three and a half years after I wrote the first draft of the script. So it took a long time to come to fruition. And now, here we are almost six years later, it's playing, you know, in festivals and coming out on streaming. So it just shows how long um, it takes to make a film um, from the conception of idea to when it's actually delivered and people can see it. Um, I think I, I've lived seven different lives since this Brian character, you know. I, I was going to say, yeah, like writing something even after the sort of idea or the emotions that are at the root of the script pass and then trying to get it made and then being in it, you know, and kind of as an actor reliving those experiences or bringing yourself back to that frame of mind in which you wrote it. And then going back into the edit and making sure that it all supports the story and, and seeing the final product has to be just kind of a surreal experience. And Definitely was, surreal. Yeah. yeah. And you, you nailed it. Like, I mean, I remember we shot it when I was 27, I'm 29 now. And I remember I was talking with my friends who were helping me make this movie. And I was like, we need to shoot this soon. Otherwise it's not going to be believable that I look 22 anymore. <laughs> I was like, we, this is like a real catalyst to getting this thing made. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I, I wanted to play myself um, obviously, you know. Yeah, as you should. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting to see a coming of age style movie. I mean, I feel like that's kind of the genre that it fits mostly neatly into, even though, you know, there's comedy and there's drama and there's other things going on, but to see a coming of age that isn't high school, you know, I feel like that's where the vast majority of these coming of age movies happen for obvious reasons, you know, like there's a lot of change happening at that point in your life. But I really commend you on choosing like a different point in our lives, because I would say that the existential kind of like chaotic feelings that happened to me, yeah, it was after graduating college, because I feel like college is kind of a common next step after high school um, for a lot of people. And nobody really prepares you for what happens after that. Yeah, thank you. I'm, gl I'm glad you kind of caught that because that was something I thought about too while writing the script was what kind of movie do I want to see? Like I want to make stuff that I want to see, but I haven't seen or at least haven't seen very often. And yeah, there just really aren't too many movies that are made about that kind of 22 to 28 period of life, which is really when a lot of these big existential questions kind of kind of come up for a lot of folks. A couple movies come to mind that do do this really well is uh, Kicking and Screaming, which is Noah Baumbach's first movie. Mm -hmm. um, that was definitely an inspiration. Uh, that, that movie also opens on a graduation party. It's set at a college campus rather than family home, but definitely grown some inspiration from that, as well as The Graduate um, from the 60s. Yeah. And then, you know, another movie I love is Francis Ha, but that, that kind of captures people more at like, you know, their mid to late 20s, sort of after you've been working for a few years and you're still kind mm -hmm. of in that what is my life situation but yeah it's true a lot of movies are set in that high school age and then 
it's almost like Hollywood just does a gap for 10 years and then we go to the marriage movies, like all your rom-coms. And yes. Everything. And I, I have such a hunger for movies that are in that um, space, maybe just because I'm in that uh, time of my life, but it's um, unco- uncovered ground, I guess you could say. So I was really pleased to be able to make something that kind of captures this this moment in time. Especially, I feel like a lot of filmmakers make their first films in that gap, you know, in your in your like mid twenties, and it's interesting that we don't get to see that as often. So I really I, I appreciated that a lot. I also love all of your inspirations. Francis Haas, huge for me. I feel like that, you know, mumblecore era in New York City especially is so formative to indie film. And you mentioned that a lot of comedians that are in New York were in your film. So touch on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, first, the mumblecore films definitely were a big inspiration of this. Just this idea that you can get together with your friends and, you know, get a camera and start shooting. I mean, that's how my short film and my web series came about. And having made those things, it was like, oh, well, a feature's only, you know, 3x longer than a web series, right? So if it wasn't for those kinds of filmmakers paying, paving the way to be like, you can do this and, you know, you can do it with limited resources. It definitely has kind of propelled, I guess, this, you know, next generation of filmmakers. I did stand up for uh, about three years. Um, When I first moved to New York when I was 23, I kind of just jumped right into stand up. I, I knew I wanted to write screenplays. I knew I wanted to be a comedy writer. I've always kind of had an outgoing personality. And I did do stand up comedy one time while I was in college. So my friends were like, you should just do stand up because I was always watching stand up. And, you know, I got very into it. I got very plugged in. I made a lot of friends. I, I was a kind of good comedian. I, I wasn't <laughs> incredible, but I was, you know, kind of good. I would get like a guest spot here and there at a comedy club. It was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, comedy, it helped me form my writing chops just because you have to be efficient with your communication when you're performing, just because audience, especially in New York, lose patience. But through that whole experience, I made tons and tons of friends doing stand up. And I met a lot of really talented collaborators. Luis Galle, who plays the security guard, he was one of my first comedy collaborators. Him and I had a podcast together for a long time. We had a web series together and also in partnership with Matt Hardy, who plays the George character, who's sort of Mm -hmm. the buddy comedy figure in this movie. So those are two of my best friends outside of, you know, making creative projects. So, and kind of branching off of that, you know, we, we have this great network, you know, Brittany who plays Amanda, Tom Luciano, who plays Keith, my boss, and then, you know, brought, brought on a couple of other uh, comedians as well. Francis Ellis, who plays this cameo role, Dr. Steven, uh, very Mm fun. Osama Siddiqui, who's a you know great comedian. I think he's I think he might have did an episode of the Sex and the City reboot and a couple other of those you know Sweet. kind of bit parts. Um, he does the voiceover of our workplace training video, mm-hmm. <laughs> our active shooter training video. So <laughs> we were able to just kind of fill in a lot of these smaller roles with really just people I met doing standup. You know, I would just send people a DM be like, hey, we're shooting this movie. I know a pandemic is going on, but if you're willing to come fly to Ohio, because at this point, no standup was happening, right? All the bars and comedy clubs were shut down because of COVID restrictions. So I think a lot of comedians were really eager to perform and everyone was like, hell yeah, I'll fly to Ohio and and shoot a movie. Um, <laughs> so that that's kind of how that all came about. With most of the comedians, I just said, just be yourself. Because they've already done so much work and years and years of performing stand-up to cultivate their own performer personality. Right. So they're just so easy and fun to direct because you don't really need to tell them to do anything. Just be yourself. And that that just usually always works, um, at least in comedy movies. So yeah, Luis was great. He had a lot of great um, improvised lines on set. And same with Matt, who plays George. I mean, some of the things they said in the movie that are look totally different from the script, but the spirit of the line was captured and then they would say it in their own way. I think sometimes as a director, you have to decide like, okay, when do I want to control this and, you know, make sure that they're saying exactly what I want. And then other times it's like, oh, what they say might be way better than anything I could have ever come up with because it's authentic to them. So that was kind of a fun journey as a director to kind of, you know, figure out which, which button to, to press. Yeah. I love the collaborative spirit. I feel like that's so intrinsic to indie film, you know, like pulling your friends on board or listening to maybe a different line reading or leaving a little bit of room for improvisation. It always lends this like freshness and groundedness to movies that I really appreciate. Something that really intrigued me that seemed very planned was the baseball 
dream sequences. Is that a dream that you have had or is that something that you made up? Like explain a little bit without giving yeah. too much away what that's about. No, I'm so glad you you brought that up. That was very much intentional. I remember when I was on draft eight or nine of the script, pretty deep into the script. At this point, it was like the first or second month of COVID. We're all in lockdown and I was having a lot of conversations about the script with Matt Hardy, who plays George in the movie. Um, and, you know, I at one point I was just having a, a bit of writer's block and I was describing this dream that I've had where I'm in the batter's box, I can't hit this baseball and the ball's just spinning round and round and around the bat, right? And um, of course that's featured in the trailer if anyone wants to check out the trailer to the movie. But, oh yeah, um, we'll put it, it'll be attached to this. <laughs> so they'll, they'll see it for sure. But I, I told Matt about this and it was in the context of a conversation about the movie and the movie in, in some ways is about, you know, Brian's quest for agency and carving out his own path, right? And Matt just said to me, he was like, that's got to go in the movie. He was like, we got to find a way to get this dream in the movie. And um, yeah, we we shot it. Um, there's a baseball stadium in Columbus, Ohio called Cooper Stadium, which is where the Columbus Clippers used to play. The Columbus Clippers are the AAA baseball team, um, part of the Cleveland Guardians organization. They used to be part of the Yankees. Um, but they have this old stadium called Cooper Stadium, which is abandoned. No one's allowed to be there. There's fences and barbed wire and cop cars of everywhere um, just because people go there to like smoke weed or whatever. And me, um, the DP, Cal Green, and one of our uh, crew members, Grant, um, we we broke in and we filmed those scenes. And right as we were getting into the car um, to drive away, like a cop showed up and didn't see us. I mean, it was really guerrilla filmmaking for sure. So it was really cool. And it immediately started raining right after we shot that. Wow. Um, but yeah, that was very much a dream I've still had. And um, I won't say what happens with those dream sequences as the movies progress, but I will say this, I do not have that nightmare dream anymore. Wow, um, you like exercised it from yourself. I think so. I think by filming, that's a hot tip for anyone listening. If you have a bad dream, just film it <laughs> and incorporate it into your indie movies. Now, of course, if you have one of those dreams where all your teeth are falling out, maybe don't, maybe don't yeah. capture that on film. That could get a little dangerous, but um, <laughs> yeah, every, every Q and A I've done about this movie, everyone has asked about the dream. So it, this seems to be hitting home in some way, whether you know, the circumstances of the dream might be different. We all have that dream, right? Yes, yeah, the dream that we, we wonder, like, is this just my brain making stuff up? Or is this like something I'm actually supposed to pay attention to? Um, and I think that, yeah, I really, I think that it's a really interesting, like, device throughout. It kind of, it, it reminds us, it brings us into his, like, internal struggle um, in a very different way than the rest of the movie does. So, yeah, you know, I think so too. Thing. One time someone did ask me why baseball? He doesn't play baseball. And I was like, I don't know. Good point. Yeah. What, <laughs> so maybe, what, that's a, maybe that's a small hole in the script, but I was never a good baseball player. Maybe it's that, but my answer is always, that was just my dream. So I don't know what else the dream could be. Yeah. It's your creative prerogative. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> um. So something else that I really enjoyed was the score and the the music in in general was really lovely and supported the story really well. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh yeah, I I love music and films. It's one of my favorite um, parts of film, and you know I I think music is really part of your toolkit as a director, and it's part of your voice as a director, whether people realize it or not. And I think all directors have their strengths. I, music is definitely. I think it's one of mine, um, for lack of a less pretentious way to put it. I, I just love music. I, Before I got into film and comedy, I spent my high school years and early college years playing in bands and playing guitar, everything from like playing in rock bands to like doing my high school jazz band. Like, I just love music as musicians. So I've always kind of just had an ear for it, especially when I'm watching films. And I mean, I love Martin Scorsese's movies. He's always featuring like, you know, Rolling Stone songs and everything. And um, really have just, you know, fallen in love with some of my favorite scores over the years, like La La Land, that score is amazing. The Social oh, yeah. Network score is amazing. Uh, Carol, which is a wonderful movie. The score in that is beautiful. Carter Burwell, one of my dream composers, if I could ever work with him. But anyways, I um, when the movie was being created, you know, as a comedy, a lot of comedies just don't have scores. They're all soundtracks. The scores kind of have a little more of a dramatic air to it. But as the edit was coming together, <clears throat> I was like, 
I think this movie is, it's a dramedy, right? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, there are moments where there's like screwball antics in the office and Brian and George, like we have a joke about 9-11, like it's a comedy, but there are also these heartfelt moments where score is really warranted. And this was maybe November of 2020. I was helping a buddy move um, instruments into a rehearsal space in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. And it was one of those moments, you know, when your friend asks you to help them move and you're just like, ah, shit, I don't want to help him move. Yeah. (laughs) It It was one of those moments. And I was like, you know what? Fine. Like maybe I'll get a free coffee out of this. So I helped my friend move and I'm standing outside of this rehearsal space and I was smoking a cigarette and the guy who was opening up the rehearsal space was standing there and I'm kind of awkward and shy by nature. <laughs> so I was like, ah, do I want to talk to this guy who my friend knows? I was like, maybe I should, I'll just like look at my phone and look at Twitter. But I was like, no, just be present. Ask this guy how his day is going. Ask him who he is. So I started talking to him and, you know, he starts telling me about how he works at this rehearsal space and, you know, how he's a composer. Um, and then he, you know, goes on to tell me that his uh, wife is a director and that he's composed the scores for, you know, his wife's films. And I was like, oh, no way. Like I just directed my first indie film this summer. And he was like, oh, cool. Like, you know, if you ever, you know, need a composer, let me know. And I was like, well, right now we're trying to figure out whether this film needs a score or not, you know, just the dramedy comedy thing. And he was like, yeah, here's my number. Let me know when you guys finish the edit. And yeah, you know, three months later when we finished the edit, I called him up and I was like, hey, so about that score, (laughs) Um, so yeah, Chris, Chris Bordeaux is his name and he's a wonderful composer in, in conjunction with his partner, um, Mike Abuso. Um, yeah, Chris and Mike are just incredible composers. They work out of this little studio in Greenpoint or in, um, uh, sorry, Gowanus in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, they just did such a great job and they, I kind of gave them some, some scores that I liked, um, you know, Lady Bird is a score I really liked and, oh, yeah. um, just as some inspiration, but half the songs that they submitted to me, I was just like, no notes. This is perfect. We don't need to make any more changes. I mean, these guys were real professionals and yeah, they've just done a lot of great indie film work over the years. So I, I totally lucked out. I mean, some people say it's a New York moment, but I truly think it was some sort of serendipitous, almost spiritual moment meeting these guys all yeah. from saying yes to helping a buddy move. <laughs> Again, it's that spirit of, I feel like New York specifically, but you know, independent film where you're just kind of always looking for new people to bring into your life and into your art and yeah I love that being present you know led to such a great great thing I think that's something that Brian also kind of has to learn like hey maybe if I'm more present maybe if I'm like more in my life then things will fall into place yeah and I think too like you know, so much of our generation, like, you know, we grew up on our phones. So sometimes like when we're bored, we just look at our phone. Right. And that was definitely one of those moments where, oh, I could have a conversation with this person. You know, it just shows like, it, you know, you don't just want to like go up and talk to every single person you see. Some people are like, hey, get away from me. But when it when appropriate, like, why not? It, it, that, that was literally a life changing conversation because they delivered mm-hmm. just such an amazing score. And then Yeah, I also worked with Andrew Luft, who is our music supervisor. Um, He was incredible for filling out the the soundtrack cues. And um, I had always wanted to get some songs from this indie band, Camp, who I love. They're one of my favorite bands. And they're from Columbus as well. So I was like, we have to get a Camp song. But, you know, they've blown up in the last few years. They're on tour with like Muppet and Sons and Lumineers. And they're playing all these festivals. So I was like, there's no way they'll agree to do this like low budget movie um but we we sent them at the scenes with the uh with their songs in them and their manager wrote back within 48 hours and was like this is awesome you know super interested let me put you in touch with all the contract people and then we didn't hear anything for like three months so we like we almost gave up and we were like Mm -hmm. fuck like it's not gonna happen and then a few months later we heard from, you know, all the business people got, got the contract sorted out. I I was honestly shocked. Like Andrew and I, we had moved on to like looking at backup tracks. It was really demoralizing. And then when we got that email, Andrew called me up. He's like, dude, you're not going to believe this. (laughs) So it all worked out, but yeah, that was a journey as well. But yeah, just being able to have, um, you know, music from one of my favorite bands and in my movie, like sometimes I forget about it. Like it really makes me feel about as lucky as I could possibly feel. Um, I don't know if it's quite like Martin Scorsese and the Rolling Stones, but 
for for me, it kind of is. Yeah, camp is your Rolling Stones. <laughs> yeah, it is. I would love to have their music in all my films. They're well, just so incredible. Thank you so much, Michael. This has been a really great conversation and uh, I'm really excited for everyone to see the rest of your life. You'll, you're able to purchase tickets now to the festival in person, but you can also um, buy a pass to our virtual festival and watch it there if you're not able to make it out to Bozeman. So thank you so much, Michael. Thank you so much, April. Yeah, this was great. And yeah, look forward to seeing Bozeman. I've never been, so it's going to be fun. Oh, it's gorgeous. You're going to have a great time. <laughs>